Hey family, I'm PT, Pastor Tore Roberts, and the lead pastor of the Potter's House at 1 LA in Denver. And on behalf of my wife, Pastor Sarah, and myself, we want to welcome you to our channel and to this word. I cannot wait for you to hear what God has for you in this message. I want to tell you a few things really quickly. Subscribe. If you're not already subscribed to this channel, subscribe so that you can be made aware of all of the word that's coming at you week in and week out. And also turn on your notifications so you don't miss a morsel that comes forth. We're also grateful for you and your partnership. If you are so uh, compelled, we invite you to support what we're doing, not just our church, but what our church is doing. There are a number of outreaches, a number of things, critical, necessary things that we support and we're able to do it because of your generosity. So without further ado, let's get right into this word. God bless you. I'll see you soon. Hallelujah. Family, I'm so excited to be with you today. If you are tuning in from wherever part of the world, just put it in the chat where you're from. It's so lovely to just know the impact that we're having and just where everyone is tuning in from, it's beautiful. You see, family, this past Sunday, we just celebrated Easter. And I'm still on the Easter high because you can never get enough of celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I think about the Lord, I think about what the book of Ephesians tells us, that when he ascended, that he took captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. That is so affirming to me because it's a reminder that Lord, when I think about the cross, I think about the fact that whatever could hold me bound, whatever had the power to keep me captive, that I no longer have to worry about that because your resurrection was the guarantee that I would also rise up to. That anything that had the power to be a hindrance to my ability to walk in the fullness of who you know me to be, that you took it captive and you gave gifts unto men. Did you know that you are the gift? That the gifts unto men is that the Lord gave you, you. He gave you the ability to be unhindered by fear and doubt and insecurities and to tap into the fullness of your faith because of Jesus. And so just right now, I want you to put in the chat, just say, no excuses, no excuses. You can even put a hashtag if you want to feel more cultural, right? <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. But before we go into the word today, I want us to pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the word that you have purpose to go forth. Lord, only you can do with it what I can't. Only you can cause a word to bring conviction into our hearts. Only you can cause a word to bring transformation and healing in our lives. And so move, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, family. Today, if you're taking notes, my message is start building. And I'm going to be reading from... Genesis chapter 7 from verse 7 to 9. And it says, So Noah with his sons, his wife, and his son's wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two, they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. Now this is so, this, first of all, this scripture just has so much that it's so intriguing to me. I mean, imagine, right, all the animals of the world coming to you. <laughs> and before we dig into it, you know, I don't want to assume that everyone knows about the story of Noah. You know, Noah was a man who really in a time that God had purpose to send a flood to wipe out all of humanity. And it was just because of the deep level of corruption and violence that was taking place on the earth that God found favor in Noah. The Bible tells us that Noah found favor in the eyes of God rather. And so Noah was this man who really intrigued me because I was like, God, in all of the earth, Noah was the only one that you could see would carry this out. You know, sometimes when when you read the Bible, you want to really get a full context of it. Like, Lord, you know, wasn't there any other person, any other families with the animals that were worth saving? But then the Lord began to show me that it was not about who was being, who was worth saving because the Lord would not turn anyone away. But the key thing about Noah is that the Bible tells us that Noah walked with God. You see, there is such a difference, right, between, between knowing God and walking with God. 
Many of us, we know the Lord, right? You had an encounter with God or, you know, there are things that happen in your life that really makes you understand that Jesus is real. I have that on my shirt. Jesus is real. (laughs) But there are things that happen in our lives and we're like, you know what, Lord, I know that you're real. But there is a difference between saying, I know that you're real and I'm walking with you. Because to walk with God is to say that, God, I'm in agreement with your will over my life. That whatever you you desire of me, whatever you say I am, that I am walking this thing out with you. There's a scripture in the Bible and it tells us that can two walk together unless they agree. That in order for us to walk together, we have to be in agreement. How many times have we found ourselves that when God gives you a word, you start arguing with him? Even when we have this false humility that, Lord, it can be me. Who am I to do this? It's a disagreement. In those moments, we're not walking with the Lord. You see, the difference with Noah in these times is that he had the stamp of obedience, a lifestyle of obedience that separated him from everyone else on earth. Because God knew that if I was going to find someone and instruct them to do what no eye has ever seen, that I can count on Noah. This was about God looking for who can I trust on the earth with this assignment. And Noah was that person. You have to understand that in that time, the whole idea of a flood by the way of rain is something that literally no eye has seen because it never rained up until the time of the flood. And so when God meets Noah and he's telling Noah, hey, this is what you're going to do. And this is what I I require of you. We see this obedience that just oozed out of Noah's life. Even when it was something that he had never, ever seen in his, in his world, he, there was no reference for it. Noah said, yes, Lord. You see, you might be that person. Perhaps maybe there is a dream, there is a vision that God has put in your heart, and there is no reference for it. There is nothing that would really inspire you to know that this is possible. But I want you to recognize that when we look at the stories of these men and women in the Bible, it tells us that that's not an excuse, that it is possible with God and it is time to start building. I want you to be the type of person that you would have the confidence to say, I am one who walks with God. You see, I believe that, you know, Noah had a a great grandfather and his name was Enoch, right? Enoch was in the Bible. It tells us that Enoch walked with the Lord and then he was not. Just all of a sudden, God just took him away. And a fun fact about Enoch is that he lived 365 years. 365, that's the number of days that make up each year. But you see, what I love about this story is that God shows us this picture that what life is about is about walking with him. It's about being in agreement with his word over your life. I believe that Enoch, God just took him because Enoch figured it out. That as long as I am in sync with God, I don't even have to see death. He was such a great example to us that this is what life is about. And so when I'm telling you start building, it's not just about, you know what, let me just get this vision going. It's to say, don't miss a step with God. Don't miss a beat with God. When the Lord gives you an instruction, when the Lord puts something on your heart, when you start taking time to argue and and question if you're not the one, that you are, you are moving behind him when God says, walk with me. Let us move in agreement. Don't be in disagreement with me because this is what causes men and women to stand out in the world. And so let's look at this scripture, right? The scripture tells us, you know, it introduces Noah. So Noah builds the ark. Noah is obedient to the Lord. And then it says something that is so fascinating to me. It says two by two, now referring to the animals, that they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God commanded Noah. Now, the animals are responding not because God commanded the animals, but because Noah did what God commanded him to do. I find this fascinating because when I read a story like this, I'm thinking it's the Bible is going to say something like, you know, the animals came two by two as God commanded them. But then it says, no, as God commanded Noah. 
Then in, you know, even previous to this scripture in Genesis 6.20, it gives us another picture. It says, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. This is when the Lord was telling Noah, look, when you do what I've said, the animals will find you. This is so beautiful to me because a lot of times, one of the arguments we find with, between ourselves when the Lord commands us to do something is that, Lord, how is this going to be? How is this going to happen? That there's so many elements to this. There's so many layers to this. You start, we start thinking like, okay, God tells you to build the ark. Now you're panicked because you're like, okay, if I build the ark, now am I supposed to go find the animals? I am not the person that will go on an animal hunt, first of all. Because by the time I see a spider, I don't know who's going to be more scared, me or the spider. It's probably me. <laughs> so I don't know how I'm going to lead something that terrifies me. But you see, it was never about that. Because the place of your calling, that is the place of partnership with God. There is a role that you play and there is a role that God plays. All Noah had to do was play his part. Noah, build the ark. Stop going seven steps ahead. How many times do we find ourselves in that? That when it's time to build the vision, we're thinking about, okay, in month three, you know, how am I going to keep up with this? How is this going to work out? And all God gave you was the first instruction. You see, the instructions of the Lord are not given to you for you to add your vision to it. The instructions of the Lord are given to you so that you would be dependent on him. That Lord, okay, what are you telling me to do right now? Let us walk together. It's not a race. It's a walk with the Lord. That step by step. Okay, Lord, I'll build the ark. And it's beautiful because as Noah built the ark, the animals responded to the sound of his obedience. You see, I want you to write this down for those taking notes. That obedience has a sound. When you are obedient to the things that the Lord has spoken to you, it has a sound. It releases a sound on the earth to everything that is connected to your next step to find you. You might feel like, but God, I don't see the next step. Well, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. We walk by knowing, Lord, that you are in this thing with me. You see, recently, my mother, she started this new real estate project. Now, this project, it it's, has so much value to the family because for 20 years, my mom used to tell me about this dream that she would have. And she would say, Stephanie, there's this dream that God keeps showing me, literally, maybe even over 20 years, but I can track as far as 20 years. And she would talk about this land that is close to like a bed of water. And she's just like, I don't understand this. I keep seeing this land over and over again. And I don't know what it means. And every time I have this dream, it's different, right? At, you know, at some points, there's construction that starts. At other points, the building is finished. At other points, there's something else being added to the building. And literally, year after year, there was not one year that my mother did not have this reoccurring dream. Just recently, we discovered that there was a land that my father, my father was murdered when I was a baby. We just discovered that there was a land that he left behind that we had no knowledge about. So my mom had sent some people to check this land out. And when they sent some photos to her, she called me and she called me just with tears of joy. And she said, Stephanie, this is the thing I've been seeing in my dream all these years. That when she looked at the photos and looked at the videos, it was literally next to a body of water. And she said, this is what God has been showing me. And she knew just instinctively that if God has finally brought it to me, it's time to build on it. And we started praying. We're like, God, what is the purpose of this? And through just clarity from the Lord, we began to understand this is the, this is what God actually wants to do with this property. And the truth of the matter is that, you know, as a family, we come together, we talk about things and there's so many other things that we're working on. So at first my brothers are like, Hey, you know, why don't we do this? Why don't we wait till next year? And my mom reminded us because my mom does a lot of different real estate projects, but every time she starts, she says the same thing. She says, I don't need to know how we're going to finish it. I just need to start it. Because when I start it, I know that God will make the way for me to complete it. And so with this very property, my mom just said, look, I know we may not have all that it takes. If we are trying to 
think about how we're going to finish it from the, from the beginning, from the conception of this. I don't know if we're going to do it. But my mom said, but as long as I start it, God is going to make a way. That he is going to make the provision for what needs to happen. And just like my mother, I believe that we all have to embrace this understanding that I don't have to have it all figured out in order to start. You see, it's so interesting in life that we find ourselves crippled by this idea of how is it going to happen? It's happened in my life before, you know, not too long ago, actually. There was something that the Lord had put on my heart and I really found this. It's almost like, you know how you, you may find yourself settled in this idea of discouragement because you're like, God, this feels too big. But then the Holy Spirit reminds you, don't fall for this idea of false humility. When the Lord speaks to you, it's a mirror. He already sees it in you. He already knows what you have the ability to do. And he's telling you, would you come into agreement with what I know about you? Don't be crippled by the how. Noah wasn't crippled about how are the animals going to come to me. He just believed that God, as long as I do my part, I know that you're going to make a way. As long as I do my part, whatever else needs to be settled, you're going to send that to me. You see, whatever the Lord has said to you, the how is not your issue. And, and many times we've heard about that. But what I want you to be more focused on is not the how, but the why. Why is God telling you to do what he said? What is the why behind your assignment? You see, just recently, our pastor and first lady, Pastor Sarah Jakes Roberts, she released a book called Woman Evolve. When you read the book, even just when you look at the book, immediately you understand her why. You understand that there is a why behind this, that this is for women everywhere around the world to break up with their fears and revolutionize their life. That this is a book, it is a calling to every woman that wherever you are, that it is possible for you to walk in the fullness of who God has called you to be. What I love about that is, the, is just the, the reality that you see the why right in front of you. You need to get back to the why of what God called you to do. There is a why behind your assignment. And when you begin to embrace that why, the deeper you are in the embrace of the why, the more connected you are to the heart of God. Because the heart of God is in the why. God doesn't just tell you to do things because he's bored. And he wants to see, let's play the game of obedience, right? Who is going to be the most obedient on the earth? God is not bored. He doesn't need to play games. When the Lord gives you an assignment, he recognizes that there is darkness on the earth. And I've called you to be light in this area by walking this thing out with me. When the Lord gives you an assignment, he says, I can trust you to represent me. I can trust you to be light. You see, one of the things I'm so fascinated by this, I, this idea of embracing the identity that we are light. Because the Bible tells us something so beautiful, right? It says that Jesus is the light of the world, but Jesus also calls us the light of the world. And so when we find ourselves in this place of wrestling with God, where are you? Look at all the evil that is happening. The Lord says, I sent you. You represent me as well, that you are the light of the world, just as I am. And so when I give you an instruction, we are walking this thing out both as light to invade darkness and to show the reign and rulership of our Lord Jesus. It's not just about this game that God wants to play with you. There are lives on the line connected to the very thing that God has called you to do. And so when you begin to embrace the why behind it, you understand the heart of God. And when you embrace the why, you can trust God with the how. Now, to be honest, when I say start building, I recognize that you know, as creative beings, we, we have a lot that in our minds we want to build, right? If you give me 10 minutes with a pen and a paper, I'll probably give you 10 ideas of amazing things I can do. So when I talk about start building, 
I'm not just talking about the random ideas that we can come up with because that is our nature. We can come up with all kinds of things. I'm talking about the God things. I'm talking about the things that the Lord has placed on your heart. The vision that is bigger than you. The vision that is not just about you and yours, but the vision that is connected to the people of God. That is connected to communities. That is connected to seeing people set free. That is connected to seeing the kingdom of God being established. What of the kingdom of God being established looks like? It looks like freedom. It looks like justice. It looks like love. It looks like healing. It is beautiful. It looks like transformation. I'm talking about that thing that will keep you up at night. The thing that you know that without God, it's not possible. You see, when you have a dream, when you have a vision, that if you just take enough time, you can plan your way to the finish line, then you need to rethink where did this come from? Did this come from me or did it come from God? Because whatever comes from God, it requires him. What comes from you, you can figure out with your, with your connections, your relationships, and your finances. But what comes from God, it has a sense of dependency on God. And I'm not, so I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the very thing that comes from him. I'm talking about that place where God becomes your partner. And without him being your partner, there's no way forward. This is the kind of vision I'm talking about. This is what I'm calling you to start building. You see, there's one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, and it's in Psalms 127, verse 1. And it says that unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Now, some of you might be wondering, well, if the Lord is building, child, I'm going to (laughs) chill. But when you listen to that scripture, it says, unless the Lord builds a house, They labor in vain who builds it. Now, when the Lord is the one building the house, if you flip it, then they don't labor in vain. So there is the Lord building, but there is also labor happening. This also mirrors, again, this idea and understanding of co-working, co-laboring with the Lord. The Lord is building and you are building because you're both building the same vision. And it gives us this sense of balance, right? That, look, I can trust in God. I can trust that, God, you are the one who will be the way maker. I can trust that, God, you are the one that would open doors for me. But while I trust in God, that I'm still going to move with actions. Because the Bible tells us, it says, faith without works is dead. I love this scripture because it shows us the balance. It says, yes, have, find rest in knowing that God has you, but also be responsible to do the work. Don't just rest and lose the the idea of responsibility because it is a co-partnership with the Lord. Don't just say that, God, I have faith in you, but then where you are right now, with what you can do, you do nothing. There's a parable, there's this um, scripture when it talks about, you know, the parable of the talents. And it talks about how Jesus gave, you know, I mean, it's not Jesus in the parable, but he's, the, he's really speaking about himself. But it's about this man who gave different talents to his servants. But then there was one servant that he gave a talent to, and the servant said, well, you know what, I just buried it. Because when you, whenever you came back, I'm like, hey, here is what you gave me. Here's the one talent you gave me. I buried it, didn't do nothing with it. And when that, when that servant spoke up, the Lord said, look, You know what? I'm going to take what I've given you and give to those who understood how to multiply. That there were those that he gave talents to and there was one he gave to and he brought him back for I believe. Right. And the Lord looks at him and he's like, yes, well done, good and faithful servant. And then rewarded them with more. So wherever you are in life, you have something to start whatever God has put in your heart. Don't be so crippled by this idea of, okay, what is going to happen in year two that you don't do what needs to be done on day one? There's something that day one requires of you. Have you committed to it? And again, don't look at this as just let me do this for the Lord. No, this is how we walk with God. This is how we step in agreement. Our everyday lives is in tune, is in step with God. This is a beautiful thing, family. You see, and I recognize that perhaps for some of you, it might not be about, you know, building the vision. It might not be about building this, you know, grand thing or whatever the case might be. You may feel like, well, this sounds amazing, but God hasn't really put anything in my heart. Then it could be about building you. You see, there's a scripture that the Bible tells us about. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, it says that we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. There are moments in life when we are taking the role of being in partnership with God to execute a vision, to execute a word, because when God gives you a word, it is his will revealed for humanity, his will revealed to touch the earth, right? It's heaven touching earth. So there are times that that is the case, but there are times that we take on the identity that we are God's building, that we are God's vessel. And in order for God to use his vessel, the vessel has to be healthy. The vessel has to be equipped. And so when I say building you, I'm talking about building yourself into the likeness of Jesus, that you begin to guard your heart from anything that could be contaminants. You see, sometimes you may feel like, God, I'm, I'm praying for clarity about this. You know, who am I? What have you called me to do? But when you search your heart, there's unforgiveness. There's bitterness. These are things that clog us. It clogs our channel from receiving from the Lord. And so there are moments where the Lord says, right now, I want you to focus on becoming everything in my image, becoming and taking on my likeness. That right now there are things you're, de you're dealing with issues of the heart and you need to get that stuff cleaned up because it clogs you. It contaminates even how you perceive things. It even contaminates the word that flows through you. Because when the Lord begins to speak, all of a sudden, the way you might receive it might not be the way he intended for it. You see, there's a scripture that tells us that blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And it's not really talking about, these are, they're not saying when they go to heaven, they will see God. They're saying their lifestyle, the lifestyle of the pure in heart is that they shall see God. What is beautiful about that is that when you have a pure heart, you, you have the perspective of God over everything. That it's not just an argument. When you're looking at it, you're not looking to pick up, you're not looking to pick a fight. You're looking to be the peacemaker. That you have his perspective over every area of your life. This is the beauty of a pure heart. And so when things start to contaminate your heart, the Lord says, pause. Now let's focus on you as my building. Because if I'm going to use you, you have to be clear. You, have, you can be clogged up. So it could be that in some, for some people, that what God is focusing on right now is be my building. Represent me. And you're going to be tested in those areas. Your love is going to be tested. Your patience is going to be tested. Your faithfulness is going to be tested. Don't look at it like, woe is me. Look at it and recognize, wow, this is an opportunity for me to see myself, for me to recognize what is in my heart. That in this place, I stand my ground. That I'm not that person who was moving in bitterness anymore. That I've chosen love. I've chosen forgiveness. And so even this week, some of you are going to get tested because the test is not working against you. The test is to reveal you because many times we don't even know what's in our heart. And many times we are taking on the narrative that we are still holding on to so much pain, not even recognizing that you are healed. You know, one of the assignments of Jesus was to proclaim liberty to the captives that, hey, I know you're living like you're bound but you're actually free. Could it be that you may think you're bound by what broke you, not recognizing how much you've grown and how much you've developed and you are so far from that person and God uses situations to show you, I am not who I thought I was. I've matured, I've developed. I am not who they say I am, but actually I'm embracing them who God says I am. This is the beauty of when you recognize that you are God's building. You see, family, I do believe that this is a message that the Lord wanted me to share with you because you have to recognize that there is always an appointed time for everything in life. And we honor God by being in position for his appointed time. There's an appointed time for the things that God wants to work in your life. And how we honor him is to say, God, I'm going to prepare myself. I'm going to position myself for the appointed time. I don't know when it is, right? The Bible tells us that times and seasons belong to the, to the Lord. They don't belong to us. And God has a track record of doing things when it's not convenient for us. 
You see, as I began to pray over this message, I began to hear this phrase that make room for now. And I was wondering, God, what do you mean by this? Make room for now, because now is this present moment, but now is also recognizing now is a moment that comes upon you and it cannot be delayed. So when the Lord says make room for now, he's saying that you're not going to recognize when I just sneak up on you with the appointed time. That you're not going to recognize when a destiny moment, not that you're not going to recognize rather, but you're not going to know the timing. You're not going to, you're not going to have the awareness of, it's not going to be on your calendar when God has scheduled something to take place in your life. So he says, make room for now. And how do you make room for now? You position yourself and you prepare. You just don't, you, when you, yes, yes, you're in prayer and yes, you say you're one who believes God is going to make a way, but have you prepared the very things that the provision is supposed to serve? And so make room for now. God is going to interrupt your normal, but when he does, would you know it? That's why the scripture says, behold, I do a new thing. And now that it, it, now that it rises up, do you not know it? Now that it springs forth, don't you see it? That the Lord is doing a new thing. He interrupts your normal, but you cannot see it because you did not make room for now. You did not make room for that moment, that inconvenient destiny moment. Because all along, the Lord has been speaking to you about moments that will lead up to this. And true faith has actions connected to it. What are the actions that you have been sitting on? That the Lord is saying, look, I didn't tell you step A for you to try to figure out step D, E, F, whatever. You can do that with your own vision. But with my own, with what I give you, you walk with me. You don't go ahead of me. You walk with me. So make room for now. There's an appointed time by the Lord. See, I was talking about Noah to you earlier. But I recognize that even Noah... Even the flood, I do believe that the flood even had an appointed time because there's something that intrigues me about the story of Noah. You see, his grandfather, Enoch, when the Bible tells us that Enoch walked with the Lord, there's not that much we learn about Enoch in the scriptures, but there are a few things that the Bible you know, believes was important to highlight. It's important to highlight his age, what happened when he started walking with the Lord. You see, there's a scripture where the Bible says that when he fathered, he had a, he had a son named Methuselah. And it says that when he fathered Methuselah, that Enoch walked with the Lord. And when I saw that, I'm like, God, you are a God. Uh, you know, you, you, you play with puzzles sometimes. I said, there must be an insight about this man, Methuselah. So I began to study him. I said, what was it about Methuselah that caused Enoch to walk with the Lord? What the Bible shows us about him was how old he was when he passed away, how old he was when he had a son, how old his son was when he had a son. And it shows us the lineage all the way to Noah. And what I discovered when I began to study their ages and what happened when, Enoch, when Methuselah died, you see, in the year Methuselah died, that's when the flood happened. That was when the flood began. Methuselah is the, I mean, he's known to be the oldest living person in, in the whole Bible. And what shook me was the fact that could it be that when Methuselah was born, there was a revelation that came to Enoch, that Enoch, in the year this child would die, there would be a flood that will wipe out all of humanity, but I will preserve humanity through your seed. Could that be one of the reasons that influenced Enoch to recognize, I need to walk with the Lord? Because the Bible clearly tells us in the, after he fathered this boy, he began to walk with the Lord. So there must be a connection there. Nothing ever happens randomly. No story. You know, one of the most boring things to read in the Bible is to read about people, how old people were, right? The book of Numbers, sometimes you're like, why? Maybe you're just a number in the Bible, right? <laughs> But these stories are so key for us to understand what God, it's, it's almost like these little puzzles that God is trying to say, nothing happens randomly. And so when I saw this, I said, could it be that even the flood had an appointed time by the Lord? But what would have happened if the Lord encountered Noah and Noah said no? Because at the end of the day, we have free will. 
What would that have? I don't even want to know. I mean, I wouldn't even have the ability to think of what would have happened because I would not be here. (laughs) And so when the Lord gives you a dream, he puts a dream in your heart. He puts a vision in your heart. He gives you a word. He reveals his will to you. You honor him by being positioned and prepared for the appointed time. We don't know when that time would be, but the Lord does. But the question I have for you, if what you have been waiting for, for so many years, if what you have been praying for happened tomorrow, it happened right now. If while I'm talking to you, you had a phone call, you received an email, would you be ready? Would you be prepared? You see, so many times we walk away from opportunities, not because it's not supposed to serve us, but we realize that we are not as prepared as we once thought. And so if all the things that you've been saying, God, if you just do this, what would you do if he did it right now? And we have to be honest with ourselves. You see, the person that deserves 100% of your honesty, God already knows it. But the person in the mirror, when you look in the mirror, that person deserves your truth. Don't lie. Don't don't eat your own hype, (laughs) right? Don't do that. People might hype you up, but don't eat that up. When you look in the mirror, be real with yourself. Have I done what I can? Have I given it my best? Am I putting the best effort? I'm saying this to myself as well. There are things that I had to also assess in my own life to say, God, Am I actually ready? If you did this right now, am I actually ready? So family, let's start building. Maybe you're building the vision with God, or maybe you're in the place of letting God build you. Maybe you're in the place of just saying, Lord, I surrender. I'm dealing with some heart issues right now. I'm dealing with some stuff. My heart is contaminated and I cannot move from this place. I give my heart to you. Help me to heal. If you need to go for therapy, hey, get in therapy. But even while you're in therapy, submit yourself to the counsel of the Holy Spirit. He is the greatest counselor. Submit yourself to to his leading. What he tells you to do, submit yourself to that. Get a professional and get the counselor, right? And so in this time, I want to pray with you. You see, I recognize that There are times that God would just draw you to something and you don't even know why you're being drawn to it. And I recognize that there are some of you right now, you're watching this, but maybe you have not given your life to Jesus. And so you've been building things. Even when I talk about start building, you just feel like you almost felt irritated because you've been building things and you've watched it crumble. You've been building things and it came to nothing. You see, that scripture says, one of the scriptures I read, it says, unless the Lord builds a house, those who labor, labor in vain. You want to invite God to build with you. You need Jesus in your life if you don't know him. And the beautiful thing, he's always ready to get in. He's always ready. He's like, look, I've been here all along. I've been with you all along. I just needed you to recognize my presence. I just needed you to submit to my leading. You see, you may feel like submission means, you know, relinquishing control of your life. But submission, actually, submission to Jesus is gaining your life. That is what happened with the resurrection. He rose up. He took captivity captive and he gave you, you. In Jesus, we know our truth. In Jesus, we are revealed. And so maybe you've been wrestling with, I don't know about this God thing. I don't know, you know, it just seems too controlling. It's not at all. That's religion that makes it seem controlling. Your truth, truth by definition has restrictions. So you cannot be everything. You can't be this and that. No, the Lord Jesus begins to show you the reality of who you are. And you want to know what he calls you. And you want to know the things that he's called you to build and the things that he will partner with you on. And so if that is you, you're saying, Lord, I need you in my life. Because even before we, we get, we start to rom- you know, rom- uh, romance this idea that, okay, I just want to build this thing. No, I need you. I need to be built up first. 
I need you. I don't need the things that I'm supposed to do. I need you. Because the reality of life, anything we do from the Lord, it flows from the place of relationship with God. We don't do things to just have a, a status or whatever. It, it flows from love and that comes from him. It flows from compassion and that comes from him. It flows from kindness and that comes from him. And so the first thing you need is to have a relationship with the Lord. And if that is you, I just want you to put in the comments right now, that's me. That's me. I really want to accept Jesus. I want to make him Lord and Savior. And what does that look like? We're going to pray and we're going to declare that, Lord, you died on the cross and you were raised up. And when you were raised up, I was raised up to you died for my sins. And because of you, I now have access to the Father. But it doesn't end there. That's just the beginning. That's your declaration of saying, look, Lord, this, this is who I am. I want to be submitted under your leading. And then you begin to surround yourself with like-minded people in the faith. I would encourage you to sign up and join one of our small groups. Get connected to people that can nurture your faith, that can fan the fire of your yes to the Lord. You need that. So you're going to see a QR code and it's going to link you to a form. I want you to fill that up because we're going to get your information so we can get you connected and get you plugged in with groups that would really build your faith. And so right before we pray, I also want to just, you know, recognize those who are saying, look, Lord, I have not been building with you. I've been building my own thing, but I want to build with you. I want to walk with you. I've known you my, all my life, maybe. Right. All my life, I've known the Lord. <laughs> I've known you, but I haven't walked with you. When you talk to me about who I am, I begin to argue with you. I'm saying, Lord, that's not me. That's for someone else. I've been playing this whole false humility game. And I want to say, Lord Jesus, I say yes to what you see in me. I want to walk with you. I want you to put in the chat to here I am. Here I am. I want to walk this thing out with God. This is what life is about, family. It's about walking with the Lord. And so let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love and we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit that is ministering to each and every one of us right now. Lord God, have your way. I thank you for those that have said to you, Lord Jesus. Those that say, Lord, I declare with my mouth, that you are Lord and Savior, that you died on the cross for my sins. And when you were raised up, I was raised up too in you. Those that are saying that, Lord, I don't want to follow this past life. I don't want to follow the way of brokenness anymore. I want to follow you. I want to follow what you know about me. I want to get in relationship with you. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you would be the one who protects their process. That, Lord, you would increase them and just heighten their discernment to know what are the relationships that I have the ability to entertain and what do I need to let go of. Recognizing that this is a sacred space and this is a sacred time that I want to be built up in you, Lord God, and I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be dancing around, you know, one moment I'm with the Lord and the next moment I'm back to the thing that broke me. Lord, I thank you that you would give them the strength right now to say no to the things that they need to turn away from in order to follow you fully. And so, Lord, have your way. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for those that have acknowledged and saying, Lord, I haven't really walked with you. I've known you, but I haven't walked with you. I thank you for the grace that will come upon their lives, Lord God. The grace to recognize that, Lord, I am who you say I am. Lord, I thank you that they would also walk in a discernment of knowing what does not please you, knowing that false humility is not pleasing to you, that what you say about us actually echoes who we truly are. And so, Lord, I thank you that they would begin to receive that. I thank you that they would receive your love because when they know that they are loved by the Father, they would know that everything he says about them is true and they are worthy of it. And so, Lord God, have your way. Thank you for your goodness and thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Family, we love you.